today's meeting, we're going to be talking about black holes. And the reason we're going to be talking about black holes is because they're extremely interesting. And we had a meeting um, a few weeks ago where we just answered questions from a lot of you. And a lot of you had lots and lots of questions about how black holes work. So we're gonna go through the basics of black holes to begin with, and then we'll have perhaps a longer Q&A session so that you can give us all of the questions you have about black holes and we can see how well we do answering them. But before we get into black holes themselves, we need to understand what black holes might be, why they are in the universe. So uh, here's a question to start out with. What's the heaviest thing around you right now? So put your answer in the chat. Tell me what the heaviest thing around you is. Um, have a look around. What do you think is the heaviest thing that you can see? Um, I should also try and do this. I'm not too sure. <laughs> Gravity. Oh, my dad. <laughs> yeah, a bed. Air, air is a pretty good one. Fridge, the planet we're sitting on, that's a very good question. That's a very good answer. The house, yeah, houses are very heavy. Myself, yeah, people are also pretty heavy. The earth, a barbecue, yeah. The universe, that's probably, that's actually a good question. Does the universe actually weigh anything? I think it might all end up canceling out. Um, a monster truck, <laughs> there's a monster truck near you. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, the multiverse, yeah, it's lots of lots of really cool answers. So I should have. You're very right. Around is a very loose term, and it could be absolutely anything. And because I didn't specify a range, so good job thinking about the the limits of this question. Um, but immediately around us, the the closest and heaviest thing is, of course, um, the Earth. And the Earth is big and heavy, and it's so big and heavy, in fact, that we all stick to its surface. None of us go flying off into space, or at least the ones that don't have rockets strapped to them. And that's because the Earth is very large and very massive and holds everything down. So that's one of the things that gravity does. It holds things together. Um, but the question that we can also ask is how heavy things are. So what do you think the answer is um, between these two? Which is heavier, the Earth or the Moon? Let me know in the chat which you think would be heavier. A lot of people saying the Earth. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So I saw one person say none, and that's also kind of true because heaviness doesn't really make much sense in terms of space because heavy, your weight is something that gravity gives you. What well, I should be saying, which one has more mass? So if we look at the mass of these two objects, then we see that the Earth has a very lot or a very large amount of mass, six times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. So that's a very big number. So that's a six followed by 24 zeros. Um, I weigh about 70 kgs. So that's a seven followed by one zero. So you need to add 23 more zeros behind that to get me at the same mass as the moon or the earth. And the moon is seven times 10 to the power of 22 kilograms. So we can say roughly the earth is about 100 times larger or more massive than what the moon is. Yeah, so James has typed out in the chat the, <laughs> the number of zeros behind the earth. So that's a very big number. Thanks for doing that, James. So the moon is much smaller than the earth and we know this um, and we can also ask ourselves which one is the correct orbit. So we have two situations here. One is the earth goes around the moon and the other is that the moon goes around the earth. So which do you think is the correct option? The, a lot of people are saying two. The second one, yeah, yeah, okay. So none of you think that the moon makes the earth swing around it. So a question we can ask is uh, why, why does the moon orbit the earth? Why does the moon orbit the earth? Let me know your thought in, in the chat. Why would the moon orbit the earth? Someone suggests it's lighter. Um, Alex suggests it's lighter. Monique says gravity. Um, more, yeah, so Alvin says more massive earth. Um, 
yeah, so a lot of you are getting the right answer. It's the between gravity and mass. So gravity pulls things towards each other. And the thing that has the most mass kind of makes everything else go around it. So then let's go to the next idea. So which is heavier? We have the Earth sitting here, very small, and the sun. Again, I should say, which has more mass? So the sun, everyone thinking that the sun is more massive, and they're very correct if we put the masses up again. So this is 6 times 10 to the power of 24, like we saw before. And the sun is 2 times 10 to the power of 30. So the sun is about 1 million times more massive than the Earth. So that's a lot of stuff compact into the area of the sun. Um, so now that we know that things that are massive make things go around them, thanks again, James, for typing that out in chat. 30 zeros is a lot of zeros. Um, so if this is the case that um, the, the sun is heavier than the Earth, we can ask the same question. Which is the correct orbit? Does the Earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the Earth? Looks like everyone's, a lot of people are uh, doing better than early, early um, or the Greeks and the likes who thought that number two was the correct one, where the Earth was at the center of the solar system and everything went around the Earth. Um, but we know now that the sun is at the center of the solar system and everything goes around the sun. And Bob asked, why are they so close? It's because I didn't want to make things incredibly small so that we couldn't see them. So this definitely is not to scale. So don't think this is to scale. Um, so the sun has a lot of mass and makes the Earth go around the sun. So you could also ask the question um, that massive things, well, we, we know now that massive things make lighter things move around them. And as many of you have said, is because of uh, gravity. So we have gravity in the universe and we know it exists in the universe and how it influences um, the universe around us, makes things move through space. So one other thing we can think about is why doesn't the moon just orbit the sun? Why does the moon bother going around the Earth? If the sun is the most massive thing, then why does it care about going? Uh, why does the moon care about going around the Earth? So Ruben suggests it's because the Earth is closer. What other ideas do people have? William also says because it's close. Uh, Devis also says it's close, so it has a strong gravitational pull. Yeah, it looks like a lot of you have the right idea. So um, it's because the moon is so much closer to the Earth than uh, the sun. So the distance between the Earth and moon and the sun is enormous compared to the distance between the moon and the Earth. And a, um, an interesting thing is that gravity is kind of a weak force when you go very far away from other objects. So I only weigh uh, 70 kgs, and we know that the moon weighs, well, I forget how much it was, um, what it, like seven times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. But if I stood right next to you, my gravitational pull on you would almost be the same as the gravitational pull that the moon has on you. So gravity also cares a lot about distance. So we know now that gravity only cares about two things. What are those two things that gravity cares about? What does gravity care about? Let me know in the, in the chat. What do you think? Distance and mass. Good job, Tamara. A lot of people. Joseph, good. Distance and mass. Awesome. All right, everyone's got it. So gravity only cares about mass and distance. So that's a really cool thing to understand. These are the two things that matter when you're talking about gravity and how gravity works. And if you're a physicist, then you can write all of this down in terms of this equation on the right hand side. 
So on the, the left here, we have the force of gravity. So that tells us how strong gravity is. And on the right, we have the masses of two objects being multiplied together. And it's being divided by the distance between those two objects. So this is how we write down those two things or what gravity cares about in this equation here. So if any of you go on to do uh, mathematics or physics, you might come across this equation and others like it that tell you how forces in the universe like gravity talk, um, talk to other things mathematically. So now that we have an idea of what gravity is and what gravity does, we can talk about what gravity does on an individual thing. So if we have the sun sitting in space, what gravity ends up doing is it pulls everything on the sun towards the center. It tugs every part of the sun's surface and pulls it inwards, um, just like us standing or sitting on the surface of the earth, we're tugged down towards the center of the earth. But usually there's another force in the case of stars, it's all of the um, fusion of atoms going on at the center of the stars that provides a force to push out against gravity and it stops things from collapsing. Gravity doesn't win, it kind of just sits there. For us, we don't have nuclear fusion going on inside of us, which is probably a good thing. Instead, we have all of our uh, electrons and atoms all kind of pushing against each other, supporting us. So gravity is much weaker than um, how, how atoms join together on these kinds of scales. But if you were to, say, turn off the, the forces at the center or make the gravitational pull much bigger, then what you end up happening and end up seeing is that um, gravity some, suddenly is just stronger than absolutely everything. And when gravity is stronger than everything, that object just will disappear. It will crush down, get smaller and smaller, and the smaller it gets, the stronger the gravitational pull on the surface of that object gets. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it disappears and we can't see it anymore. So that thing that forms when it disappears is called a black hole. So we just made a black hole by turning the gravity of the sun up and crushing it right down into absolutely nothing. Now, black holes, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, are very interesting objects. And we're learning more and more about them, especially in recent years, that kind of make them more mysterious, but also kind of agree with what we've been seeing. So this image here isn't an image that was taken with the telescope. This is made by a simulation. So the kind of stuff that James does with seeing how gas moves around galaxies this is instead looking at how black holes will change space around them. And black holes do some pretty interesting things, like um, they make an event horizon. So this is that black object sitting in the middle. And the event horizon is the part of the black hole that's kind of the last thing that we can see. So anything that crosses the event horizon can't escape a black hole because it's the point at which the gravitational pull of a black hole is so strong, it doesn't matter how fast you go, you'll forever be stuck inside of the black hole. So that's um, what we mean by an event horizon. But you'll also notice there's this kind of area or this ring around the black hole that looks kind of messy. And this kind of stretched out messy stuff um, would be uh, quite interesting to look at and quite interesting if it existed. And the idea behind what's going on here is it's something called gravitational lensing. So in space, light travels in straight lines. So we'll go from one point to another point in a straight line. So what we see that as is on the bottom here, we have two straight lines. But gravity does some pretty strange things to space. And if you have a lot of gravity, like you have in a black hole, it does even stranger things. So it bends space around so that a straight line looks like it bends, it looks like it curves. And because light travels in straight lines through space, if space itself is bending, the straight line that light will follow will also look like it's bending. So what you have is as you get closer to the black hole, 
space gets bent and it will bend the light a little bit. So it's no longer going in a straight line. And if you get really close to a black hole, it'll bend light a lot so that you end up with the light going off in a completely different direction. So this is what we call gravitational lensing. And every object that has mass can do gravitational lensing. Our sun um, bends light from stars around it. Um, but in the case of black holes, they bend an awful lot of stuff. They bend a lot of light and they make these very interesting patterns. So something that would be behind the black hole, you can see above and below the black hole. So this is one kind of simulation where it's just a black hole sitting by itself in space. Another simulation you could do is a black hole that has something called an accretion disk around it. So in the middle, again, we have the black hole and the event horizon we can't see. And around it is a disk of material. So um, you've probably seen pictures of Saturn before. Um, who has seen pictures of Saturn before? Let me know in the chat. Have you seen a picture of Saturn with its big rings around it? James has, Alvin has, Tamara has, Catelyn has, Samuel has. Okay, a lot of people have. Awesome. Yeah, and a lot of people think that Saturn is their favorite planet. So um, that's good. If you haven't seen Saturn with a telescope, you should go out and try and see it. Especially if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, I think Saturn is starting to rise for us now that we're getting into summer. Cool. So a lot of you have seen the rings around Saturn. The rings around a black hole are pretty much exactly the same. It's a disk of material going around the black hole. And we call this an accretion disk. And Bob says Saturn isn't big enough for him. I'm a fan of Jupiter myself. So maybe Jupiter is your favorite planet as well, Bob. But you have all of this material running around the black hole. And like we said before, that stuff behind the black hole gets bent uh, around it so that we can see it above and below. So this part that goes above and this part that goes below doesn't actually or isn't really there. It's just the light that we're seeing being bent around the black hole. And the cool thing with this accretion disk is it's all the material slowly falling into the black hole. But uh, a common myth that people hear is that black holes just suck everything in around them. That's not true. Black holes tug on space and everything around them with their gravity, but they don't suck things in. Things can orbit around black holes, and over time they can slowly fall into black holes if they bump into other stuff. So what's going on in this accretion disk is that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of gas and dust and things like that all running around the black hole. And these particles are all bumping into each other as they go around the black hole and um, they get very hot and they emit light. So this is how we can see black holes is by looking at the bright accretion disks around them. And to understand how these disks get hot and bright, you can rub your hands together as fast as you can for a little bit and you can feel something happen on your hands is that they get pretty warm. And that's because friction between your hands as you rub them together makes them very, very warm. All the particles are bumping against each other and you're converting energy into heat. So the same thing happens in this. They convert energy into heat and light. And because they're doing that, they lose energy and slowly fall into the black hole. So this is what an accretion disk is and it all goes around the black holes. So this part, remember these two parts, they don't actually exist. They're just what light does, getting bent around black holes. This disk should just be a continuous thing going around the black hole, not being bent up into two things. We'll get to Hawking radiation in a moment, Alvin, don't worry. Um, so next we'll go to um, talking about this thing here. So, so far we've only been thinking about simulations and theoretical stuff with black holes. But this is a big galaxy called M87 that has a big jet coming out of it. And it's kind of like a big blob of stars and stuff. But if you take all of the radio telescopes in the world and collect them together and do some very impressive things, you can actually zoom right into the center of M87. And what you see is this thing here. 
And you can see it in the background of Marnix. Um, he's, that's his go-to background. So this is the black hole at the center of M87 that was taken, an image taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and what we're looking at is kind of what we're seeing in those simulations. There's a big bright amount of stuff going around the black hole. Um, and in the middle, the black hole will be sitting in here somewhere. You don't really see anything coming from it. You only see stuff coming from the accretion disk. And these parts are brighter than the other parts because of what we were talking about before. There was gravitational lensing going on. So more light is being bent around the black hole and shown to us here than there is from other parts of this image. So this is a really cool image and it's of a um, black hole in a galaxy that's very far away from us. It's a supermassive black hole. So this is um, a supermassive black hole far away, but we also know there's a supermassive black hole nearby or relatively nearby. Um, but before we get to that one, we have this, uh, this is more of an artist's impression of what's going on at the center of M87. So you have this accretion disk all going down, slowly bumping into each other, each of the particles, they lose energy and fall into the black hole over time. But they also get very hot and very energetic and they create a very strong um, magnetic field. And that magnetic field can shoot particles out of the accretion disk before they actually fall into the black hole. So a particle that might be falling in might instead be grabbed by the big strong magnetic field made by the accretion disk and fired out in these jets. And these big jets we can see like all across the sky in different objects. So one of those things, if you remember before, this image from M87, the galaxy where the black hole we saw an image of before was sitting in. All of this blue stuff here is one of those jets being fired out from that black hole. So black holes can do really cool things. And Ruben, you say that's huge. It really is huge. This will be thousands of light years long. So these jets are absolutely enormous. Um, so this is a composite image. So don't pay too much attention to the colors here. I think what's being shown is um, synchrotron radiation, um, which is made from electrons all running around, or it's, um, it's X-rays, one of those two. So uh, this is called M87. So this is an active galactic nucleus, and it's firing off big jets out into space. So to a more local black hole, so at the very center of our galaxy, there is an empty spat at empty patch of space where a bunch of stars seem to want to run around. So this point in space is completely empty so far as we can tell, but there are stars that are much more massive than the sun being shot around this empty point in space. And this point in space doesn't move, so it must be a lot more massive than these stars that are moving around it. So astronomers can think um, and think very hard about this and try and work out how big this thing is and how massive it must be and work out that it must be a supermassive black hole. So we know there's a supermassive black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A star. Um, and it's a, a pretty cool object that hopefully we'll also be able to take images of with the Event Horizon Telescope, which is the collection of radio telescopes around the world to make a kind of one big tel telescope. So we know black holes exist and they can throw stars around and we've taken images of them, which is amazing. Um, so let's go into some, some other things black holes can do. So we, I mentioned we'll get on to Hawking radiation. This one will be a bit tricky, so we might come back to this a few times and the Q&A session in a bit. So this is what we're going to talk about now is something called Hawking radiation. So Hawking radiation was thought of by a theoretical physicist called Stephen Hawking, who was a, a British physicist. And he thought about black holes and quantum mechanics in this case. So the idea was how do you, um, if you have 
things that happen in quantum mechanics, how do they react with a black hole sitting in the way? So one of the things that can happen in quantum mechanics is that just out of empty space, nothing is there. You can have two particles appear, go along some distance or exist for some time, and then they'll collide with each other again and they'll disappear. So what's happening is we make something called a virtual pair of particles. One is the, a normal matter particle. The other one is an antimatter particle. And when they collide with each other, they annihilate. So they blow up and they disappear. So this is allowed in quantum mechanics if they only exist for a very short amount of time. If they exist for too long, then this is impossible. Um, but if it's a very short time, then they can just pop in and out of existence and it's, there's no problem with it. So what Stephen Hawking thought about was what happens if you have um, one of these virtual particle pairs appearing right next to the event horizon of the black hole. So we said before that the event horizon, this black circle, is the part of the black hole that if you pass this distance, you can never escape the black hole. You're just part of the black hole forever. So what would happen is that, say, one of these virtual particles jumps into the black hole and gets eaten up, and then the other one doesn't fall into the black hole. So you have something interesting happens is that suddenly this particle that shouldn't exist in the universe is now existing in the universe. So if we just go back and recap this, so we have these things called virtual particles that appear and disappear. They don't really exist in the universe, but they can happen. But if you have them happening next to a black hole and one of them falls into the black hole and the other runs away, suddenly you've created a particle out of nothing. You've just made a particle out of space. So this is a problem, perhaps. How do you work out where this particles come from? And the idea is, or that Stephen Hawking had, is that you can say that this black hole has pretty much created this particle. So this particle has kind of eaten some of the black hole's energy to make itself. So it didn't exist, then it used some of the black hole's energy, and then it suddenly exists. So this is one of the very strange things with quantum mechanics, um, and it gets even stranger when we put it together with black holes, another very strange thing. So it'll be perhaps quite confusing, but we can come back to it if you have more questions in the Q&A. So this particle is running away, and it's taking some of the black hole's energy with it. Um, and if you have enough of these particles creating and running away, then it can suck away all of the black hole's energy and all of its mass so that one day a black hole could evaporate and just dis disappear into a puff of particles. But you need to have um, wait a very, very long time for that to happen. A very, very long time. Another thing that black holes can do, we'll move on from this, but you can come back to it in the questions, remember, is that black holes can collide with each other. So this used to be something that was theoretical until 2000 and, oh, I'm forgetting the year, um, maybe 15 or something like that, when the LIGO detectors in America discovered the first collision of, of black holes. So this is a simulation of one such collision. We have two supermassive black holes orbiting around each other um, and these simulations are really cool and very complicated. Um, so it's only in the last decade or so, last 10 years or so, that scientists have actually been able to make these simulations to predict what we would see. So as the text says on this, they're using the simulation to try and work out what kind of light we would see if you had two big black holes colliding with each other. And the really powerful thing with simulations, which James might be able to talk about a bit later, is that you can look at a whole bunch of different properties of this stuff, of these um, events um, in your simulations. So they have all these different things and they can look at them from different angles. So it's a very powerful way for us to predict what we'll see from any conditions. So the work of theoretical physicists is very important for people like me who are more uh, observational astronomers 
so that we understand what it is we're actually seeing. So if you like um, taking observations and trying to understand things like I do, um, then there's a, a big part of astronomy for that. But if you like thinking about problems deeply and trying to understand why these things happen on the first place, like say James does, then there's a big part of astronomy and physics with um, theoretical physics, which you could also get involved with. Uh, Ruben, you're right, it does look like they're brawling. So they'll go around each other as black holes collide, they'll go around each other and warp space very violently until eventually they end up colliding with each other. And when they collide, um, they send out big ripples that run through space that you can detect with very sensitive instruments um, around or on the Earth, mostly the LIGO detectors in America, but there's also the Virgo detector in Europe. And I think um, there's one being developed uh, in Japan as well. I think it's the Kagro detector. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, James or, or Monik. Um, but yeah, so there are all these cool things about black holes. So that's kind of the, the basics of black holes. So now I think it'll be good. I've seen some people having questions that we should just open it up to Q&A now and let James and I try our best at answering whatever questions you have about black holes.